Hello and welcome to the second part in this video series on programming a chess engine in C. So after the last video I introduced you a little bit to the various uh, resources that are available online and communities available online for computer chess we can finally start looking at what we're actually going to do in our program. The first thing I needed for the program was a name. I spent a good minute thinking about the name and I came up with video instructional chess engine so vice is the name of the engine I've created a file called vice.c I've created a defs.h header file which is going to contain all of our dis definitions as I explained for the project in the previous video I'm not going to separate things out neatly as you should do this is going to be for brevity's sake kept to a minimum and I've also made a make file where at the moment I'm simply compiling the vice.c file the output vice.exe and I've got everything stored inside a folder here at the moment you can see what's in the directory inside here. So before we actually start programming in this video I wanted to talk a little bit about the structure of the way the engine is going to work. So the way the engine's board is going to be contained is it's going to end up being contained inside a structure and the board itself is going to be represented by an array of integers and each of these integers inside the array will have a value depending on whether it's an empty square, it's got a piece on it, it'll have a different number depending on the piece, and or a number saying that the square is off the board. Now I've prepared something here using Calc and LibreOffice just to try and let you understand a little bit better how the board representation works. First of all, we'll start with this board here on the right hand side without the grey squares around it. Now, in chess, this board is looking upside down at the moment, but in chess, a where board is represented is it's represented in coordinates, and these coordinates are represented using what's called the file, which is represented by the letters A to H, and the rank, which is represented by the letters 1 to 8. So if you had a chess move that said B1 to C3, it would be going from this square here to this square here. So in this case it would be a knight moving from B1 to C3. You have to remember this board in this case is upside down. When you were actually playing you would have the first rank facing to you rather than at the other side. And ignore the numbers inside the squares for now as well. And likewise we could have knight move b1 to a3 or b1 to d2 and so on or a bishop move from f1 to b5 or anything like that but the moves are represented by what's called an algebraic coordinate notation here and if you read up a bit on chess on the internet i'm sure you'll have already found references to this kind of coordinate system so again these are the files and these are the numbers depicting the rank so if we have a piece on let's say, let me just go down a little bit, a piece on rank 7, then it would be on one of these squares here. OK, now I'm assuming that you're familiar with how the pieces move in chess, because if you aren't then please go away and read about how the pieces move, otherwise there's no point really in following the rest of this video. But we could represent, or you would think we could represent, our board quite easily in our chess program by simply making an array of 64 integers, one for each square on the chessboard, which is 8 by 8. The problem with that is, is when we're generating moves, or a list of moves in a position, possible moves, say we have a bishop on this square here, which at the moment is labelled square 45, and it moves diagonally to 36 and to 27, we need some kind of, we need some way of determining whether it's run off the edge of the board or not because it's run off the edge of the board then we need to stop trying to generate squares it can go to and the same in the other direction and so on so the way we get around this is we actually make our array bigger and define a set of border squares around the edge of the board where these have a set value say let's call it off board and we can say that if the next square in the array is an of type off board then we don't need to generate any more moves for the piece when we start doing that that'll become clearer but so therefore we need some kind of squares around these 64 to be set as off the board so that when the move generator is generating the moves we know that it's off board 
And if we go to what will be our representation in the actual engine, you can see that I've already got around the side of the board here some off-board squares listed as grey. But you'll also notice that I've actually got on the vertical an extra row of off-board squares. And the reason for this is because of the knight. You'll have read by now, hopefully, that if, for example, we had a knight on square 55 here, the knight's able to go to 34, to 36, 47, 67, 76, 74, 63, and 43. The problem comes, of course, is if we have a knight on, say, 25. This knight now can go here, but it can also go here, so it's actually be able to go two squares in this direction, and then our one, our, then our uh, protective border here doesn't actually it doesn't actually go deep enough because it goes beyond the border. And if we started our array with the, the index zero at this square here, of course it would be running into minuses, and we would have an incorrect index for our array. The same at the other end as well. If we had a square a knight on square ninety six, we have our border here to say it's gone off board. But of course the move jumps to here, it doesn't go diagonally through, and we haven't got this at the moment set as anything in our array. So this is why the board here has these two extra protective off-board rows on the top of the array here. Now you may be wondering why we don't need two rows on the sides, well it's actually quite simple. If we take for example a knight on square 38 here, and it's supposed to be jumping to here, well, that actually is square number 30, which you can see is here and has the value of an off-board square. So we only actually need the protective rows on the top and the bottom of the array. We don't need it on the sides. So what that means is we'll be representing our chessboard as an array of 120, indexes 0 to 119, of 120 integers, of which the actual board starts square A1, the value of 21 and stops with h8 with a value of 98 and each row as I've said is eight squares wide. Okay that's it then for how the board will be represented. A couple of other things we'll need to remember that we'll need inside our position structure are one we'll need a counter to keep track of what's called the 50 moves rule, so that's where if you haven't had a capture or a pawn move for 50 moves the game is a draw. We'll need some kind of key that defines a unique value for the current position on the board so that we can detect something called a threefold repetition. If you have a three times repetition in chess then the game is a draw. And we'll need something else to keep track of the en passant square, if any en passant captures are available. If you don't know what this is, then please go and read the rules on chess. And we'll also need something to keep track of the current side to move. And we'll also need something to keep track of what is called the ply. Now, the ply is simply the amount of half moves that have been made in the game. So one ply, so if in a game white moved and then black moved, we would be two ply deep into the game. If white, just white has moved, we are one ply deep. So we'll need something also to keep track of this value as well. Okay, that's it then for this video. In the next video, we'll finally start writing some code, but I wanted in this video quickly just to go through and make it clear how we're going to be representing our board for when we actually start putting it into code, because it's not as clear when you start writing it out as code definitions. Thanks very much for listening, paying attention. See you in the next video. Comments, questions, criticisms, welcome as always on YouTube.